Hi, Scott from Heretical's Trophy here. Um, what I'd like to do today is I'd like to uh, kind of finish up or begin the process of finishing up our lectures on the subsistence model, chapter one of production for subsistence. I'm doing this today in my own private studio here uh, in my office. It's not in the fancy studio with the university. Um, so apologies for that. This will be brief here. Um, I will put the uh, this lecture up on a proper format, and I'll do it again, and I'll have all the PowerPoints, et cetera, available for us, okay? But what I like to do here is I like to finish up the chapter and the analysis that we did on the subsistence model. If you recall uh, uh, the first chapter in Srofa's book, Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities, the first chapter is called Production for Subsistence. Now, Production for Subsistence, we saw, was an economic system that was characterized by the fact that the inputs that go to produce the particular output are going to be equal in value all the way around, both the inputs as well as the outputs. By that, I mean the following. What we see here in a in the subsistence model of Srafa is a system that's more in line with Kinei's a manufacturing sector, the sterile manufacturing sector in Kinei's Tableau Economique. If you recall, we spoke about it in a previous lesson, <laughs> that if you recall, that Kinei's Tableau Economique had a productive sector, which was the farming sector, which is where you had net output, a net product, and then you had a, a sterile sector, which was the manufacturing sector, where you had the, the transformation of use value inputs into a use value output, it's the, 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 uh, the exception being that the value of the use value inputs transformed is equal to the value of the produced output resulting. In other words, for Kine and for industry in general, for the physiocrats thought about this, uh, about industry in general, i.e. manufacturing, that there was no creation of anything new. There's no net output. There's no net gain in the manufacturing sector. It was only a productive consumption of inputs resulting in a produced output that the sums of which are going to be equal in value. We saw that the Kine was, of course, wrong and that uh, in, in that Kine attributed to, uh, to agriculture, the net fertility, because what Kinei had saw was that the, in, in farming, you, you put in five quarters of, out, of, of seed and you get eight quarters or whatever uh, as, at the end of the harvest. So the, the net output was very obvious and the Kinei, Kinei and the physiocrats uh, called this the gift of nature. But we saw that that was erroneous and that Smith actually came in and said, yes, Kinei's right in as much as there is net output, but Kinei's wrong in that he attributed only to, um, ag uh, to ag agriculture, whereas what Smith said is that no, the wealth of the nation is going to be the net productivity of labor generally within within that within that nation. Right. So that's what we saw with respect to the subsistence model. Now, what Srafa did is Srafa developed a subsistence model first in the two commodity case, in the wheat iron case, and then he develops it in the three commodity case where he introduces another commodity and another industry, which Srafa will call pigs. In the first case, you have biangular trade, that is to say, trade between two commodities, and then in the second, you have triangular trade, which is going to be trade between three commodities, and the triangular trade aspect of the value form is much more interesting and much more complex and it's really there in the triangular aspect of the trade phenomena of the price form that you can really begin to generalize the relation to the end commodity gauge which is precisely what Srafa does so really the two commodity variant that we get in production of commodities at the beginning the wheat and the iron industry is it, it is a useful way to begin the endeavor however it, it's not as uh, it doesn't uh, uh, really convey as much as the three commodity case does as triangular trade as triangular trade does with respect to the value form certainly with respect to the uh, the departmental analysis in volume two of capital Marx's capital schemes of reproduction we can get a lot out of the biangular uh, two commodity model and we can see a lot of the conditions of uh, of restoration as we saw in Srafa had a lot of analytical symmetry and resonance with the balance conditions in Marx's schemes of reproduction and, and we'll talk more about the relationship of Srafa to Volume 2 of Capital. Certainly, there is literature out there, specifically uh, Gilliberg and DeVivo in 2003, 
uh, publish uh, very seminal articles. I'll put the reading list on the website that talk about the um, the role of, of Volume Two of Capital in Sraffa's endeavors in the 20s, and somewhat of a, at odds with the turning point phenomenon of Garignan. But we'll talk about all these issues as we go. What I want to do here is I want to just uh, is try to break down the nature of the inquiry and in moving from biangular trade to triangular trade. So if you recall, we begin with the uh, with, with the two commodity model. So we're going to have the wheat industry, which is industry one, and we're going to have the iron industry, which is industry two, right? And so, and then we're going to have a sum, which is going to be the aggregate total. Okay, we had a wheat input for the wheat industry, a one one. We had a wheat industry for the iron, uh, the wheat input for the iron industry, a one two, and then we had a total amount of wheat, a one sum, that's used in the economic system as a whole. Now remember, our notation is the first subscript is going to be the commodity, the second subscript is going to be the industry and or the total, uh, commodity one, industry one, commodity one, industry two, commodity one, summation going to be the total, right? Similarly for iron, we're going to have the, uh, the iron input for the wheat industry, the iron input for the iron industry, and we're going to have the total amount of iron used in, an econo in the economic system as a whole, A to sum. Okay, and so this is going to be the, uh, the, the, the sum. Again, you're going to have, like we read industries across the rows and commodities down the columns. It's going to be the Sraffia A matrix, not the Leontief A matrix. It's going to be the transpose. Here we're sticking with Sraffa. We're staying with the Sraffa A matrix. This says here the following. Now we saw in subsistence production, the total amount of inputs that are necessary in the economic system are going to be equal to the output. So what we have is the following. This is going to be our wheat industry, wheat for the wheat industry, iron for the wheat industry, produces at the end of the round of production an output of wheat, iron industry, wheat for the iron industry, iron for the iron industry, at the end of the round of production produces a gross output of iron. Now, what we saw with the subsistence production is that the gross output of wheat for the wheat industry is exactly equal in, in magnitude to the quantity of wheat necessary in the entire economic system as means of production. So when we have the Q1 minus A1 sum is going to be equal to zero quarters of corn. And similarly for the iron industry, Q2 minus A2 sum is going to be equal to zero tons of iron. In fact, we took it a step further in our last lesson and said, well, we really can't even conceive of those net outputs being zero because by definition, a, subs a subsistence model doesn't have net output or nor does it have labor. So we denoted that as the empty set. And so we saw here, here we have a completely vertically integrated subsistence model. For you, uh, a matrix algebra wonks, the uh, maximum eigenvalue here is one, or the Frobenius root is equal to one. It's a singular matrix, et cetera, et cetera. Don't get lost in the math. I, I'll, I'll come back to the math as we go through this. Focus on the economics, right? So we saw last time that in so looking at this, we say, well, we know that in our integrated model, what we're going to be concerning ourselves with is going to be the exchanges, okay, of the inputs. All right, so we have our inputs, and so we saw really it's going to be equal to the cross exchanges of the inputs, okay? And so this becomes our cross exchange, and we saw that in our last lesson that this cross exchange is going to be the basis of price. We're going to have the wheat input for the iron industry is going to have to be equal to the iron input for the wheat industry. And that's where we started looking at the relationship of price. We saw that the price form is going to be that which allows for this fundamental exchange ratio to manifest. A12 is equal to A21. I put quotation marks on the equal sign. We're going to come see that in Sraffa's uh, uh, typeset. I think it's D31272, which is going to be the typeset for uh, for Sraffa's book. The the first draft that he drew that he wrote is going to he's going to have in the in, in the typist. The typists are going to be uh, typing his. Uh, 
his, his handwritten manuscript. And in the first typing, Sraffa will put quotation marks on the equal because, of course, we know that 120 tons is not equal, I'm sorry, 120 quarters is not equal to 12 tons. They're just going to be equal in value. Right? And so that's what we looked at here with respect to our cross exchanges. And then we saw that, well, with that cross exchange, we can then have the different numeraire. We can have x1 as a numeraire, and then we can have x2 as a numeraire. Numeraire. And we're going to have here that x2 is equal to the numeraire. And we saw that when we had x1 is equal to the numeraire, the price of good one is uh, the price, the wheat price of wheat is equal to one. When x2 is a numeraire, the iron price of iron is equal to one. It's going to be equal to one ton per, I mean, one quarter per quarter. And this is going to be equal to one ton per ton. And we saw that the cross exchanges are going to be exactly where we're going to look at the price form. This is going to be equal to the wheat price of iron. Iron is, uh, wheat is going to be equal to the numeraire. This is going to be equal to 10 tons, I mean, 10 quarters per ton. That's going to be the, I, the, the wheat price of iron. And this is going to be the iron price of wheat, P12, is going to be equal to one-tenth ton per quarter, right? And so we saw that this is going to be the cross exchange. This is going to be where wheat is in numeraire, and this is going to be where iron is in numeraire. But we saw that the cross exchange was going to be the basis for the price form. The prices come from the restorative conditions that are going to be, in, that are going to be inherent in the price form that this fundamental relation of exchange is going to express itself in different numeraire, and that no matter the numeraire we choose, whatever we choose, if we choose that set of prices, then the system is able to reproduce itself. Now that's what we saw in the last time with the two commodity case, and that's going to be the essence of the price form. Now we say, okay, well, how does that uh, affect itself in the three commodity variant? Well, in the three commodity variant, it gets complex. And what I want to do today is I wanted to show you the, the beginnings of trying to understand that process. First, we begin with the three commodity variants in chapter, in section two, these are the section numbers, right? In section two, this is the section number here, section two of Strapa's book, we have the three commodity case. And in the three commodity case, we're going to have the following, I'll put it right here. All right, it's going to be in section two, chapter one of Sraffa's book. We're going to have the three commodity case. He's going to introduce another commodity. He calls it pigs. Sraffa Passanetti in Lectures of the Theory of Production calls it turkeys, pigs, turkeys. The point is, it's going to be another basic commodity, which is going to be the following. So we're going to have the wheat industry here. It's going to be the wheat industry is industry one. You're going to have the iron industry, which is industry two. And you're going to have the pig industry, which is industry three. And there you're going to have your total. All right? So your sum, okay? This is going to be equal to the wheat input for the wheat industry. This is going to be equal to the wheat input for the iron industry. This is going to be equal to the wheat input for the pig industry. And then you're going to have here the wheat input for the entire economic system as a whole. You're going to have here is going to be the iron input for the wheat industry the iron input for the iron industry, the iron input for the pig industry, the total amount of iron used as an input in the economic system as a whole. And then lastly, you're going to have the pig input for the wheat industry, the pig input for the iron industry, the pig input for the pig industry, and then you're going to have the total amount of pigs used in the economic system as a whole. So again, you're going to have your industries are going to be read across the rows. The commodities are going to be read down the columns. This is going to be the subsistence model, which means we have here in the beginning, at the ex ante round of production, we have these inputs for the wheat industry and out pops at the end of the harvest the output of wheat, so too for the iron industry, and so too for the pig industry. And so we have at the end of that round of production, again, the beginning of the round of production, the inputs, the end of the round of production is the outputs. We are still in a physiocratic sterile production for subsistence model, which means then that the various gross outputs will be exactly equal in magnitude to the sum input requirements for the economic system, despite the particular configuration of the matrix. What's important are going to be the totals, which means that the total output of wheat for the wheat industry minus the total input of wheat in the economic system is zero. Our MPC 
set minus for the similarly for the iron industry empty set similarly for the uh, the the pig industry which is going to be your empty set so we have a three commodity three commodity completely sterile integrated uh, 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 system so let's consider the inputs okay so we come and we're going to do the same exercise now we're going to do as we did for the two commodity case now we're going to do it for the three commodity case it's going to be here all right, so this is going to be the, uh, the, 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 the uh, means of production matrix. And what we want to do, we want to eliminate all the own exchanges. All right, and so what we're left with is the collection of the various cross exchanges. So this becomes all the different elements in the economic system that are going to be cross exchanges. Now, what I want to do is I want to introduce here, <coughs> excuse me, I want to introduce here, the notion of the configuration, okay? And what we're going to have here is that you're going to have, since you have three commodities, we're going to have th and three industries, that's the single product industries, where the number of industries is equal to the number of commodities. I didn't stress that point. It's an important point to, to be had that we are in single product industries. We'll talk more about that as we develop our lectures. But the idea here is that we're having a completely vertically integrated relation of the various cross exchanges. And that's going to be the point here. And so since we have three different industries, we're going to have what I call three different configurations. You're going to have the wheat configuration, the iron configuration, and the pig configuration, where the configurations are going to be equal to the own relation of the commodity to the whole and the cross relation of the rest of the commodities to the own. Let me say it again. For the wheat configuration is going to be here. All right, I call this the wheat configuration. All right, now the wheat configuration, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be considering the relationship between the amount of wheat that's necessary in all the other cross industries as an input and its relation to the various cross industry inputs to the production of wheat. Okay, so what we have here is this relationship here. So we're going to have the Wheat for the rest of the economy put in relation to the rest of the economy's input in relation to wheat. And I refer to that as the wheat configuration. They're not going to be equal in value, but there will definitely be a congruency relation associated between the two. So the wheat configuration is going to be here. Okay, it's going to be the amount of wheat for the iron industry, the amount of, uh, of wheat for the pig industry, the related to the amount of, uh, of, of, of iron for the wheat industry, and the amount of pigs for the wheat industry. And so what you're going to be doing is you're going to be relating the value of these inputs to the value of these outputs. And what you're going to see here is that you're going to see that there's going to be a dual relationship associated here. Okay, and actually this is going to be something that's going to be related to what Schroppo refers to as the terminological note. It's going to actually be in section 7 of chapter 2, but the, and it's going to be called terminological note. Terminological note. If you read the, uh, the table of contents of Schroppo's book, read everything in Schroppo's book, yo. Go to the table of contents and read every single title he gives a section. Because what Schroffer does in the table of contents is he breaks the entire TOC, table of contents, down by the section numbers. And then he'll give a title for the section numbers that he does not talk about or discuss in the text itself. It's only in the title. So he calls this terminological note. There's actually a very interesting article by Bertram Sheffield in 19, uh, 1998 in the uh, European Journal for the History of Economic Thought. It's going to be called Srapa's Indices. All right. And there's a really uh, Srapa's Indices. All right. And he refer and, and what Sheffield does is he talks about the uh, the production of Srapa's uh, index to the Ricardo, volume 11, you hear me talk about, as well as references Srapa's index to uh, production commodities and actually speaks about the terminological note. So you can go there. I think that Sheffield, uh, who's never who never visited the archive, by the way, he, he saw this uh, uh, relevant in terms of just studying the material. It, it's an amazing how we're going to be able to piece everything together, guys. It's very exciting. 
But in any event, what Sarapa says in that terminological note is he talks about the twofold nature of the value form. And that twofold nature of the value form is what we're going to be seeing here. And we can see it in the, uh, in the subsistence model. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to go ahead and read a little bit from that terminological note. It's on page 8 of Production Commodities. It's going to be section 7. Again, Sarapa does this in chapter 2 on the surplus system. But I argue, and, I, and there's actually corroboration in the Mallorca draft, where he does it, actually has relevance in the uh, subsistence model. Let me say that again, that this terminological note in section 7 has relevance in the subsistence model, specifically in the Mallorca draft of March of 1955, Sraffa introduces this definition of value in that subsistence model. We'll talk more about that as we go through it, but Sraffa says this. It is desired, and again, so he's going to talk about the nature of the value form. It's called terminological note in the, in the, in the uh, index. It is desirable at this stage to explain why the ratios which satisfy the conditions of production have been called values or prices rather than, as might, as might be thought more appropriate, cost of production. Okay, so he's going to say, I'm going to call this value. Cost of production, I'm going to read it here, is going to be the horizontal dimension. Okay, what Schrapp is saying that there's going to be a vertical dimension that's relevant too, that you get lost in the horizontal cost of production aspect of the price form only. I'll read. The latter description, cost of production, the latter description would be adequate so far as non-basic products were concerned. And remember, the distinction between basics and non-basics, a basic commodity is going to be a commodity that either directly or indirectly enters into the production structure of the system, whereas a non-basic commodity is a commodity who is only, who, who's, who, who only acts as an output, right? It doesn't act as an input at all. It's going to be pure net output. Uh, you, you, uh, no inputs whatsoever are going to be necessary for that. It actually, that's going to be the net output of a lot of the analysis in the Cambridge capital controversies. We'll talk about that as we develop it, but the argument here is that, uh, is that the non-basics are going to be pure net output. There's no means of production requirement that, that use them at all. But that's, he's going to say it's not the case here because we're talking about a basic system. Okay? So again, the latter description would be adequate so far as non-basic products were concerned since, as it follows from what has been seen in the preceding section, their exchange ratio is merely a reflection of what is meant to be paid for means of production, labor, and profits in order to produce them. There is no mutual dependence. So again, what Sraf is saying is that we're going to be looking at the dual nature of the price form. The horizontal nature of the price form is relevant only if you're in a non-basic product because non-basics are only pure outputs, whereas in a basic system, we have to consider the inputs that are used as well. And that's this next paragraph. But for a basic product, there is another aspect to be considered. Its exchange depends as much on the use that is made of the production of other basic commodities as on the extent to which those commodities enter in its own production. Let me say it again. Its exchange depends on the use that is made of it in the production of other basic commodities. The use that is made of it in the production of other basic commodities as on the extent to which those other commodities enter into its own production. And so we have here the essence of what I'm referring to as the configuration, the industry commodity configuration. And again, in single product industries, the industry and the commodity are going to be the same, right? It's going to be, the you're going to have a, 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 symmetric, a, a symmetric relation. Okay? So let me repeat it again. For a basic product, there is another aspect to be considered. Its exchange ratio depends as much on the use that is made of it in the production of other basic commodities as on the extent to which those commodities enter in its own production. One might be tempted, but it would mis but oh, let me say it again. One might be tempted, but it would be misleading to say that, quote, it depends as much on the demand side as on the supply side. Now, uh, right, it'd be very, in other words, the price of a non-basic product depends on the prices of its means of production, but these do not depend on it, whereas in the case of a basic product, the prices of its means of production depend on its own price no less than the latter depends on them. 
And so we begin to see again, the idea here is that what we have is the notion of the value form as a two-dimensional relationship. Shrapa says it could be one is tempted to say demand and supply. Now, it's not demand and supply. What Shrapa is doing in that, in that terminological note there is he's saying, look, even the uh, marginalist economists recognize that there are two aspects going on here with respect to the value form. What they're doing is they're erroneously making it demand and supply. They're, they're seeing that there's a double relation happening, but they are erroneous with respect to understanding the nature of that relation. And so given their, the, the paucity theoretically of their approach, they're, they're, they're forced to say, well, it's going to be these demand and these supply relations, which when you then break them down, become very nebulous and very black box, black box like, and, and, and et cetera. And then this leads to the mystification of what we call the magic of the market. Okay, Trump is saying no. All right, so I'm saying no, there's actually two elements to the value form of a basic product. You would say the extent to which it is used in the production of other goods versus or related to the extent to which those other goods are used in the production of itself. There you begin to see the nature of the price form. You can look at, in, in classical political economy, the relationship here can be seen as the uh, relation between bestow and command. Labor bestowed and labor commanded. And I'm not in a position to talk about that in this lesson, but do keep that in mind, that the bestow-command relationship as, opposed, as, as regards to labor is going to be where this twofold nature of the value form comes in within classical political economy. Now, that's an important point because one of the arguments that I'm making is that Strapa, uh, is that Strapa, um Trump is, is a critique of economic theory, a prelude to a critique of economic theory. Now, that economic theory is not only marginalist economic theory, right? I'm saying that, that what Straw is talking about is a prelude to a critique of the science, of the, of the scientific character of economics, not just a critique of a, cra of a crappy approach. All right? I, I think, of course, we can show that the marginalist interpretation of these matters is seriously flawed, but that's really a byproduct. All right? That's not what Strauss was doing. That, that just came about as a byproduct. He, he, the only time he even talks about marginal productivity or alludes to marginal productivity, except for the, 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 uh, the, the preface, in, his, in the text of his book, he just says it parenthetically in a, in a remark on Bumbaber. He doesn't even mention Bumbaber. He talks about the period of production in chapter 6 in the reduction. Right? And that's the only place, and it's in parentheses, it's a parenthetical remark. This, his critique of marginal, uh, marginal productivity and marginal analysis was, uh, was a byproduct. What the real critique is, is going to be a positive critique of the classical political economy notion of labor bestow and labor command, or value bestow and value command. And uh, on this score, I just want to say the, the following thing that the labor theory of value is not the labor bestowed or the labor embodied theory of value, or is it not the labor commanded theory of value. Labor bestow and labor command are just different ways in which we can understand the value form. No, one is not better than the other, and one is not more correct than the other. You hear me talk about that a lot, that, that the labor theory of value, or the theory of value in general, it doesn't mean labor value, the theory of value in general is going to be a theory that's going to incorporate both the bestow relations and the command relation and try to see that there's a relationship analytically between the two. That's what Schrappa was trying to critique in the positive sense. His critique of economic theory was a critique of Ricardo. It was a critique of Malthus. It was a critique of classical political economy in his unfinished form because it was truncated in its development because Marx came and critiqued it and then boom 1870 happens and we move to an entirely different way and that's where we're at now. So we have to step back and say okay how did this truncated stifled analysis how do we reconstruct that and solve some of the problems that are associated therein. That's what's happening here. Okay, let me just finish this up. I know this thing's already too long. All right, so we have a weak configuration. Our weak configuration is going to be this. You're going to have, again, going to be the wheat input for the, the uh, cross industries and the cross inputs for the wheat industry. Okay, over here you're going to have the iron configuration. I'll put it here. All right, iron configuration. All right, now with the iron configuration, you're going to have this. All right, you're going to have the iron input for the wheat industry, A21, the iron input 
for the pig industry, A23. The wheat input for the iron industry, A12. And the pig input for the iron industry, A32. And so what you're going to be doing is you're going to be relating these inputs here with these inputs here. All right, and so again, there's going to be a cross-exchange relationship of congruency. They're not going to be equal in value, but there's going to be a congruency relation associated there. And Trappa tells us that no longer are they going to be equal in the triangle to trade, but you can see that the aggregate relations, they will be. All right, and then lastly, you're going to have your pig configuration. All right, and so with your pig configuration, you're going to have here, you're going to have the... Uh, the the uh, the wheat uh, the pig input for the wheat industry the pig input for the iron industry the wheat input for the pig industry and the wheat uh, the iron input for the pig industry and again you're going to be looking at this relationship of the input of the cross inputs to the pig industry related to the pig inputs for the cross industry there and again there's going to be a congruency relation associated with that. And so what we have here is a congruency between the different configurations where then in the aggregate you can begin to see how the value form is going to uh, how, how the value form is going to express itself. And so what we have here then, if I may, to finish this off by looking at our uh, at our different uh, at our different numeraire, right? Since now we're going to have three different commodities. We're going to have three different numeraire, okay? This is going to be x1 is equal to the numeraire. It's going to be x2 is equal to the numeraire. And this is going to be x3 is equal to the numeraire. So we're going to have the wheat, iron, the wheat prices of all commodities, the iron prices of all commodities, and the pig prices of all commodities, right? We're going to have as many numeraires or commodities and a composite. And we're going to see that the numeraire doesn't have to just be limited to the number of commodities. We could take a composite commodity. That's what the standard commodity is. It's a composite commodity in particular proportions. Right here, we're going to have this is going to be the wheat price of wheat, which is the numerator equal to one. This is going to be the iron price of iron, which is that numerator is going to be equal to one. And this is going to be the pig price of pigs, which in that numerator is going to be equal to one. One, this is going to be the wheat price of wheat that you're going to have here. This is going to be the wheat price of iron and the wheat price of pigs. Okay, this is going to be equal to so many quarters per ton. This is going to be equal to so many quarters per number of pigs. All right, and so that's what going to have here is going to be the wheat is numerator prices. Iron is numerator prices. You've got the iron price of iron, which is equal to one. You're going to have the iron price of, of wheat, which is going to be equal to so many tons per quarter. And now you're going to have here the iron, that's going to be the iron price of wheat. And this is going to be the iron price of pigs, A32, which is going to be equal to so many tons per number of pigs. Okay, and then the last column, you're going to have your pig as a numerator. Your pig price of pig is equal to one. The pig price of iron is going to be equal to so many pigs. I'm sorry, the pig price of wheat is going to be equal to so many pigs per ton of wheat, uh, per quarter of wheat. And the pig price of iron is going to be so many pigs per ton of iron. All right, and so what we have here then is a completely integrated system of the value structure. Now this is going to be the price. Again, so now the price is truly a structure. All right, so the price is not just one thing. That's one of the things that we get out of the, we have not even left subsistence production yet, guys. Okay, this is one thing we get out of the, uh, out of Strapa's subsistence model is that the price form is a complex structure of exchange. All right, and that's an important one because any one of these sets of prices, when adopted, will allow the system to reproduce itself in a manner that allows it to move forward. And so again, i.e., move from round to round, such that we see that the um, that that the that the prices therein are going to be restorative in their function of allowing the system to reproduce itself. Now, I'll go online and uh, I'll get some PowerPoints out there. I'll do another proper lecture over at the university that's going to be uh, uh, better than this in the sense it's going to be more uh, 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 more technologically driven, okay? But this is going to be the general idea. I will say that we're going to now move into the surplus model. Okay, now the surplus model is really interesting 
because with the surplus model, we now have a net output, and there we begin to see that for Srampa, the price form has an important other function to perform, that, that it performs the restorative conditions that we see in the subsistence production, but then it also has the added burden to ensure that the net output produced is going to be equitably distributed according to the different so-called factors of production, meaning that we're going to have the equitable distribution of the net output to wages in the form of the uniform wage rate and to the capitalists in the form of the uniform, or profits and capitalists in the form of the uniform rate of profit, okay? That's what we're going to be doing. Thanks a lot, guys. I, I, I think the lecture uh, uh, might be a little bit um, longer than I wanted it to be. But what I will do is I will end it here, right? And we're going to end it now. And I'll see, uh, I'll see you guys online. Thank you very much. Take it easy, okay? Right on.